Welcome. I am delighted to see people joining for our talk today on embroidered kanta. I'm just going to give it a second as people sort of filter in. It's great to have so many of you joining us today for this talk. I'll just give it another few seconds. Wonderful. So just to begin, um, I'll start with the land acknowledgement of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The museum recognizes Philadelphia as part of Lenape Hokink, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples, a long history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements, such as the walking purchase of 1737, displaced many Lenape from this land. The museum and its staff, including myself, strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonization and to act as allies to Lenape peoples and their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized nations, Delaware Tribe, Delaware Nation, and Stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Um, so welcome to you all. My name is Linnea West. I work in public programs at the museum, and it is truly a pleasure to welcome you all today and to introduce our speaker, Pika Ghosh. Pika, thank you for being here. Hi, Linnea. Thank you for having me. Just to tell you um, a little bit about Pika and her background. Uh, she teaches South Asian visual culture and religion at Haverford College. Her research interests range from early modern temporal architecture to terracotta sculpture in the religious visual culture of Eastern India, painted paper hand scrolls in performance, um, to repurposed textiles and embroidery in colonial India, and of course, uh, to Kantha. Um, her first book, Temple to Love, which addressed the role of a distinctive regional architectural form in framing devotional practice, received the inaugural Edward C. Dimmock Prize in the Humanities from the American Institute of Indian Studies. Her recent monograph, Making Kantha, Making Home, highlights female needleworkers and locates their textiles at the intersection of domestic networks, memory, perception, and emotional experience. And I will put a link in the chat to those of you who might be curious to find that book. That project builds on research that Pika was doing for the Philadelphia Museum of Art around a 2009-2010 exhibition and catalog, and that catalog received the College Art Association's Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award for Museum Scholarship. Um, so truly, we are in the room with the right person to talk to about Kantha today. Um, and the starting point for our conversation is an installation called A Century of Kanta, Women's Quilts in Bengal, 1870s to 1970s. Curated by Dillis Blum and Darielle Mason, A Century of Kanta's is on view in the Morgan Galleries, and it's a really gorgeous exhibition. If you haven't seen it already, I really hope this will inspire you to come and see it in person. And I'll also, um, I'll put a link in the chat later to that as well. So it is um, really a privilege to be here today, and we are grateful for the support of the Graduate Guides and their sponsorship of this program. Uh, so I expend a special welcome to any of the Graduate Guides in attendance, as well as to members of the End Arnon Course Society. I just have a few final notes before we begin, and I hand it over to Pika. Um, we will save time at the end for Q&A. So we ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box. The Q&A box, it has a helpful feature. If you see a question you like, you can give it a thumbs up. It'll put that question to the top of the queue. And those are the questions we'll answer first when we get to Q&A. We're using the chat to share links. And so many of you are sharing where you're joining in from today. So thank you for saying hello. Um, 
The program is closed captioned. Uh, you can use the CC button in your Zoom toolbar to turn those captions on or off. And finally, we are recording the talk today. We're going to send a follow up email. It'll include a link to the recording as well as any links I share in the chat. So you'll be able to look back at, at everything we discuss. So all of that said, uh, Pika, I'm, I'm delighted to turn it over to you. And I really look forward to hearing what you have to say next. Thank you, Linnea. And I want to thank Daryl Mason and Dillis Bloom, the curators, for both um, spearheading the project and for inviting me to share this talk with all of you in conjunction with the Century of Katha, the current exhibition displaying a wonderful range of these textiles from the region of Bengal, shared today across Eastern India and Bangladesh. And thank you also to Steve and to Cassandra for captioning, for being tech support um, through the event. If you haven't yet been to the galleries to see them, I hope this preview will entice you to get up close, to really appreciate the textures and rhythms of the astonishingly skillful needle, needlework that these textiles display. Here, I'd like to introduce you a few themes that are not immediately visible, however, when our eyes linger over the undulating surfaces of cloth in the galleries. But first, I want to point out that the Philadelphia Museum of Art holds one of the most important collections of these textiles outside of South Asia. Stella Cramrish, longtime curator at the museum, and one of the preeminent scholars of Indian art had brought with her to Philadelphia the extraordinary collection that she assembled during the decades when she lived and worked in Bengal in pre-independent India. And here you see her installation, photographs from the 1968 exhibition, Unknown India, a landmark in the history of displaying South Asian quote unquote folk art or the arts of tribe and village in her terms. And collectors Jill and Sheldon Bonowitz have amplified that body of historical material wonderfully with their acquisitions, assembled during the early 2000s for the most part. In addition, they generous, generously initiated and supported the project that would become the first exhibition of Katha in 2009-10 in this country. Today, it is easy for us to recognize how hanging these textiles on the walls of a gallery is a choice that transforms cloth textiles, cloth articles that were usually spread on the floor or draped on bodies. In framed, they look more like paintings, prints, and other works of art, particularly on white walls accompanied with labeled text. The relatively spare aesthetic of a museum gallery removes them from the clutter of homes the bustle of activity in everyday life, including the erasure of touch, smell, sounds, the movement and stillness as a sleeping infant droops, sighs, or rolls over, or the soft rustling in the breeze outdoors as on the rooftop you see on the right. Likewise, the work of taking care of such things that brings comfort and ease at home also become invisible. The memories of particular occasions, instances of use also fade away. And with them, the array of emotions that make our things such an integral part of our lives. On the walls, such a katha issues an invitation to behold, to look closely, to indulge in a predominantly visual pleasure when our eyes follow its textured surfaces along the ripples of white running stitches and the delicate symmetries and assonances created by an exceptionally skilled embroiderer who has manipulated an assortment of colored threads to differentiate each of over 200 rondelles. Yet, these distinctions often go entirely unnoticed when such large rectangular katha are used at home 
like you see here, to snuggle in their depths on a chilly Sunday afternoon when a family sits around to watch a cricket match on TV. Behind plexiglass, the complex sets of choices, the decisions navigated in the processes of making these textiles may also be harder to appreciate without handling them, without magnification, without blue light. And because I got to spend a lot of time looking at this katha with the museum's curators and conservators, I got to marvel at the techniques at how the maker chose to assemble three pieces of thin worn cloth, extricated probably from a woman's sari or a man's dhoti. The designer who has identified herself as Kamala in her inscription, layered the pieces aligning selvages for strength at one end and tucking away the most worn areas, concealing others with dense embroidery. Much as we might patch a hole at the elbows or knees of our own garments as they wear. When held up to the light, patted down, turned around, they yield clues to the problems that the needleworker has intentionally and skillfully resolved. Indeed, mending and repurposing old cloth is an important aspect of traditional kapata making. The associations of thrift and virtue in the region's literature and poetry suggest both a Victorian legacy celebrating domesticity and femininity and real need in a region that had been impoverished as the harshness of colonial taxation ravaged the countryside, particularly through the 19th century. In everyday use, Kantha continue to be washed and reused until they're reduced to rags which likely then went on to making pulp for the paper industry in the next phase of the lives of these textiles, of these cotton fibers, sorry. This process is often understood today as ashul kantha, real kantha by makers to distinguish them from a host of more recent practices that were introduced over the 20th century, such as institutional production in NGO or factory environments, using new cloth, embroidery hoops, stencil designs, and such textiles then are distributed through emporia and boutique outlets in the urban center centers worldwide. And this production process continues side by side, providing significant sources of income for rural women across the region. The sensibility of the traditional katha associated with a body of textiles survives from as early as the second half of the 19th century, between the urge to reuse textiles to pulp and the dampness of the monsoons, they haven't survived from much earlier than that. We find them in Bengali homes, heirlooms tucked away with sachets of red chili peppers or neem leaves, margosa leaves, in storage trunks and, al and almiras cared for by traditional means, such as sunning during the dry winter season before they're used, as well as in museum collections where they are rolled carefully between tissue and humidity controlled environments. Together, they share features that, that distinguish them as a regional product, assembled from layers of worn fabric and hence the color of the is hardly white. It's usually more gray or yellowish. These recycled layers, valued for their softness, are first secured at the corners and then strengthened with stitch work. The rows of running white stitches that you see here is often called the kantha stitch by association with this practice. It can be long or short, taut or loose, variously spaced, sometimes densely packed, creating the slightest pucker, undulations along the surface and rhythms as a background against which colorful embroidery is then prepared. The spacing and density of running stitches can thus tell us about the decisions made, about repair, about giving body to thin fabric, uneven textures and rhythm. The colorful embroidery was sometimes from threads also pulled from the ornamental woven border patterns of the original garment. 
the range of patterns created in the repair and refreshing of the layers of old cloth are truly remarkable. Diagonal parallel running stitches, in this case, create the field of a rectangular katha. The ornamental black border embroidery is used to try out a style of embroidery that we today associate with the region of Kashmir and with wool for the most part. Sometimes the embroidered borders embellish or replicate patterns that are woven on sari borders called par tola, par meaning border. Here you see Shagar Muni Sharkar, an embroiderer in Kolkata, explaining her choices to me using her own sari as example. Some katha surfaces are used to display the maker's skill in imitating these border patterns in embroidery, while others have repurposed the rows of woven borders left over from worn out clothes and then aligned them in stripes against a white background to create a shawl of many stripes. Such diversity of both creative and pragmatic innovations is equally visible in the play with techniques. From applique to cross stitch, ruffles, fringes, tassels, and in material from silk, wool, jute sacks to raffia and beads, and vivid colors of background cloth. Here is a frayed single layered silk shawl. It was being repaired by Anima Nagchodri on the right when I first met her in Kolkata working for the 2009 exhibition. She was filling in dense running stitches to hold the loose th silk threads where they had split. Mending transformed the surface and the aesthetic of her original creation entirely, now giving it body and a much thicker feel. And iconographic experiments in Katha imagery include animal figures from children's books, even a green-nosed reindeer on the right. And from Lal Kamal and Il Kamal, a very popular tale from Thakumar Juli, the grandmother's sack of children's stories in Bengali. Here you see Bangoma Bangomi, a pair of birds who are the narrators of the story at the bottom right corner of the katha. Other women toyed with the imagery on playing cards, for example, creating visual games for the viewer. And here the fabric surface is also an interpretation by the woman designer of a very famous literary work, Rabindranath Tagore's 1933 satire called Tashir Desh, or the land of the playing cards. Yet others chose to embroider letters of the Bengali alphabet, alphabet, as you see here, up on the top three rows, and then her own words, her composition of her process. Such katha may be created for occasions such as a child's hatikori, the auspicious first ceremonial attempt at writing, witnessed as, and blessed by gods, priests, and elders of the family. Such choices bear witness to what seems to have always been a flexible practice undertaken by women to suit their needs, skills, and visions. Katha can constitute a wide range of household rituals, as you see here, both intimate everyday acts and more grand affairs. Square seating mats, for example, are used for ceremonial meals, like a baby's first taste of solid food, or spread in rows on the floor, spaced equally for a family to sit down to a special meal. Larger squares or rectangular ones may be used to construct a domestic altar for temporary worship. The textile then becomes embedded in a multi-sensorial invocation of sacrality, together with the light from the oil lamp the smell of burning ghee in which the wick of the lamp is suspended, fragrant floral garlands, incense sticks, 
the sheen of bell metal and silver. Embroidered motifs may flow into the ones drawn with rice paste on the floor. Here you see Onima and Bonusri Nagchutri, their sisters-in-law who share a passion for needlework. They were ruminating on their experiences as they showed me their work. He described the mechanics of sewing as a reflective or restorative process. Katha making is necessarily slow and steady, dhir sthir in Bangla. It requires deftness and steadiness of the hand to smooth the layers of cloth, to draw, to create even or uniform stitches. And the process cultivates patience, dhojjo, they observed. With the decrease of household responsibilities as their children have grown up and left, they have a lot more time and flexibility to indulge in it. Shagur, the third woman in that household, had come in search of work to their house in Kolkata from her village in Khulna district, now in Bangladesh, across a border that separated the two countries. She explained to me how important and tricky it was to prepare the thin layers of cloth, which are first mended, patched, and tucked inside, while sturdier fabric segments, ideally single pieces, constitute the two outer surfaces. Thus, three layers are usually assembled, or four to make a more durable kanta, such as a seating mat. Thus, the layers are placed carefully on one on top of the other, smoothed down to avoid any folds and secured at the corners with long thorns from the date palm tree. It takes more than a single pair of hands to do so, she noted. And Bonusri jumped in to explain that in the city, we use embroidery pins, the pearly ones, and substitute for the date thorns of Shagor's village. The drawing then commences. And, and finally, embroidery in colored threads, which moves from the corners to the center. And last, the background is filled with the small, evenly spaced white running stitches that have come to be defined as katha stitch today. Together, these women reminisced about the physical discomfort, even pain in the, involved in the process how their eyes are strained by close hand-to-eye coordination, how the fingers get marked and the skin broken by the end of the needle prodding, how the shoulders hurt from hunching too much. But they clearly enjoyed it. They described it as an addictive pleasure, often staying up late into the night or working in the dim glow of candlelight. They recalled how hard it was to put aside a motif as it was flowering, puteota. As their fingers got into the rhythm of executing the running stitch, picking up uniform numbers of threads with the needle, so the length of each stitch and the space between them evened out. Such repetition of hand movement was the source of the, their pleasure. As the needle advanced, the length of fabric left behind in the other hand grew, adding to the satisfaction of accomplishment. The momentum stimulated the desire to repeat the hand movements again and again, to explore variation in repetition, to execute a stitch or a form perfectly. That acute physical sensation is an intimate reconnecting with oneself. The nostalgia for that exhilaration arising from their engagement of mind and body was visible in their smiles. They remembered how difficult it was in their younger days when they had a lot of responsibilities to turn away from chores like cooking dinner or taking care of the children. They recalled being chided for neglecting some of these daily domestic duties as they relished their quiet time in the silences of the evenings. Shagor added quietly, however, that as a little girl, they had to finish homework before they could pick up needle and thread later in the afternoons. 
Kantha making thus offered them discrete ways to claim a quiet space for themselves amidst the busyness and the demands of everyday lives when women had to be available for the needs of many other family members. In highly permeable multi-generational households where doors could not easily be shut for long stretches of time, the practice of embroidery identified with the cultivation of femininity and domesticity offered alternatives. It could have created a way to be partially present, physically available for children, spouse, in-laws, at whose beck and call many women spent decades of their lives, and yet at the same time, perhaps creating a flexible boundary, an arena of autonomy, an emotional wellspring of nurturance, pleasure, solace. It may have constituted a space of companionship or unease with others similarly engaged side by side, silences or conversations. Shagur also recalled instances of collaboration from her childhood experiences of learning to make katha. She remembered sitting with older women to spread the secured cloth surface, moving and turning it as needed for a more experienced katha maker with a steadier hand to draw the lines of motifs or to write an inscription in an elegant hand using turmeric water, holud jol, as the lines of yellow turmeric can't be erased so easily. She wasn't very good at drawing herself, but she could stitch comfortably after an underdrawing had been prepared. Circular lines, for example, were traced during li using lids of containers, photo dakna, and concentric circles required assembling a graded set of them. Sometimes lids of the right sizes had to be borrowed from across a few neighboring households to achieve the desired spacing between the circles to fill with particular patterns, as you see here. Shagur also remembered walking around with a little pillow cover, palishir tuwale, from house to house to pick up stitches, interpretations of motifs from her neighbors who were good at particular ones, shilai tola. Skilled hands intervened in the efforts of younger girls in a variety of nonverbal communications, from pushing a finger down, thereby tightening or loosening a stitch, to clasping the smaller ones, to pull the needle and thread to attain the desired tautness without wrinkling the base cloth. It was how she had learned the feel of the right amount of tension between fingers and palm to prevent puckering. Because embroidery proceeded from the ends to the center, bunching could end up quite pronounced in the middle if this skill wasn't internalized. If there were particularly conspicuous folds, threads, or even areas of embroidery would have to be undone. And at worst case, the cloth would have to be cut away and patched if it was particularly frayed. Kantha related skills had varied among the women of her village in her recollection, learning to identify who was particularly adept at each juncture of the process had helped her to turn to them to acquire their ways of doing these particular aspects of the work. Her sister-in-law, Ja, for example, was especially good with making the ruffled ends for palm leaf held handheld fans, pakar jhalur, a ruffle. And sharing moreover was not restri restricted to motifs and mechanics during the time spent together. When women and girls gathered in courtyards in the afternoons, they swapped stories, gossiped, composed silly rhymes, sang songs, braided hair even, while each worked mostly on her own piece in companionable, pleasurable gatherings. The lines between individual work and such more casual collaborative efforts in such intimate bodily processes can be less distinct than is often remembered when a finished katha is presented by a single maker 
or identified by a singular stitched name displayed on a katha in the museum gallery. However, other aspects of the process can visibly single, signal the work of one hand. The rhythm of the dense wide running stitches that are used to fill the background after the colorful motifs are embroidered, Chagor insists could not be consistent if multiple hands participated. Such experiences underscore the visceral nature of katha making and the individual's body at the center of it. The act of remembering the patterns executing the running stitch between needle, thread, and cloth and implementing it with speed and precision is an inherently bodily practice. Through continuous repetition of stitches, the movement of the fingers guiding the needle, raising the arm to pull it, connect mind and body. And the repeated acts of filling the dense surface with evenly spaced white stitches, embroidering repeated motifs as on this katha can perhaps be understood as a viscerally grounding act of meditation. This katha, Chadur, in the Banovitz collection is inscribed throughout its length with the sacred chant, Hare Ram, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. It explicitly invokes two major Hindu gods, Ram and Krishna. Stitched repetition of these sacred words, along with the repetition of uniform stitches to create the surface with them, may have helped a maker to cultivate her own meditative silence. Remembrance of Krishna through his names, moreover, whether verbal or visual, is regarded as one of the most effective forms of reaching the divine. The blessings that are invoked in the act of embroidering these words then, the names of God, and embodied in these prayers that are stitched on the shawl, would then sheathe the body of the person who was intended to wear it. It would be like a protective blanket offering the blessings of the maker and the gods. Bodily and emotional experiences are also layered on Katha with their movement from individual to individual and from home to home. And in the inherent portability of Kantha articles lies their exciting potential to inform the conventions of one larger family with the Kantha making practices of another household. To ignore their travels, moreover, would suggest a limited understanding of the home as segregated rather than embedded in the flow of objects, ideas, interactions, and emotions. Nibedita Vasu, seen here, showed me a katha that had been given for her son Deep's baby blessing on the left. It had originally been stitched for her husband when he was a baby by his aunt, that is to say his father's sister. She had chosen to compose a poem, offering it as a blessing, Ashirbad, which she stitched in bold red chain stitch, along with her name, and date below, framing her words with a green woven border extracted from her own sari. This katha, already a generation old and used, was then sent by her mother-in-law to Nibedita's parental home where she was resting when she first had her baby. The katha had thus circulated across the city of Kolkata, inhabiting three homes in the course of its travels. The first movement had connected the maker to her natal home, a gift for her brother and sister-in-law's newborn. The same katha, cared for after many years of its initial use as a receiving blanket, was brought out from storage for the next generation, another new baby boy, and sent for that boy's baby trousseau, ceremonially reaffirming the social bonds with his wife's Nibidita's family. The Katha thus reinforces existing familial networks, inserting individuals into an existing social map 
making modifications and accommodations to incorporate new individuals over the generations. In such processes of transmission and care, ownership is intertwined with choices that are negotiated among multiples of women. This katha, which Anima Nagchodri made for her grandson, was saved by her daughter-in-law Tutu for the boy's wedding trousseau. It was done with such love and care by her mother-in-law for the first grandchild in the family, Tutu explained, she couldn't possibly let a naked baby lie on it. In fact, she remembered, she had only used it one time, making sure the baby had a fresh diaper, and then she put it away. Implicit in her choice to protect this delicate katha from wear, from everyday use, is her appreciation of the beautifully executed embroidery stitches and the love and care invested by her mother-in-law for the new baby. Anima explained that she had started this one after she made an extremely elaborate one over two years for her daughter's wedding. She then wanted to give one for her son's family. And I read in her decision an attempt to establish equilibrium to give equally among her children, much like the choices that women make to distribute their jewelry or other valuables among their children. Now she was repairing this katha, filling the body again with small closely spaced running stitches. They were salvaging it for the boy's wedding and Tutu would hand it on to another new daughter-in-law coming into the family perhaps establishing their relationship with such objects in the same way that her own mother-in-law had done 20 years ago using the same katha. These choices are then physically imprinted on the object in the acts of caretaking and mendering and reconfiguring ownership along the way. Their propensity for travel also makes katha malleable, receptive to the imprint of many hands, known and unknown to each other. They can thereby conjure images of many homes, places, senses of longing and belonging. When I began to work on the 2009 exhibition of katha, I began to notice how many Bengali women had brought these things to Philadelphia and New Jersey with them in suitcases. It seemed like these articles participated in making new homes abroad. Katha shawls, such as the one made by Anima Nag Chudri for her daughter's wedding, now lives in Philadelphia. A connection between a mother and a daughter and the many homes that Bengali women move through their lifetimes. Here you see Eva Ray's shawl, of many stripes, a new hole fabricated from old sari borders, from garments that had been worn by her mother, her grandmother, and her aunt. They had come to embody family, bearing their touch, and the shawl connected her physically to these women who had raised her. With it draped on her shoulders, I could see Eva as a first-generation immigrant woman making her own life in Philadelphia, leaning into their embrace, support, and strength as she did so. Another friend shared that in her family, old cloth was gathered up and sent from Kolkata to Dhaka in hand luggage with family members on that short flight. They were stitched into shawls and blankets and then resent back to Kolkata. Gatha in this family was important enough to be transported by a family that had been separated in the decades following the 1947 partition of Bengal into its Indian and Pakistani segments. A border that is no more than a stack of bamboo, seemingly flimsy, yet often insurmountable and painful. Her narrative alerted me to the potency of these textiles to connect families split across the bloody lines of partition, 
of West Bengal and Bangladesh. Colorful threads, Rakhi, had played a visible role in contesting that partitioning, the first partitioning of the region in 1905, when Rabindranath Tagore had harnessed the domestic celebration of sibling bonds into the public domain to physically renew the ties among Hindus and Muslims and protest against British colonial rule. Rituals of repurposing old cloth by making katha seem to also have been important enough to be carried in bags across a border that seemed to be congealing in the 70s and 80s. In repairing and renewing these social and emotional ties, binding separated branches of families, is it possible then that textiles were also symbolically engaged in a kind of restitching of a cultural region, despite the reality of two independent nations? And could they then engage in healing the losses for the many fractured families now inhabiting multiples of modern nations? Such stories suggest that the textiles displayed in the museum's galleries are also likely to have borne witness to similar processes of making and relationships among individuals tying communities. It is useful to ask what elaborate processes of care do they reveal or conceal? What sorts of movements and bodily engagements remain only partially visible in their layers of thickness, their shapes, in their rhythms and patterns of white running stitches across the surface, in the stains, in the wear and repair, as well as the colorful motifs and the inscriptions that adorn their surfaces. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take your questions, of course. Thank you so much, Pika. I think if um, we were all in a room together, you would hear a loud applause right now. That was such a beautiful uh, presentation, not just because of the information you conveyed, but I think from the way you really evoked a sense of how these kanta were produced and the environments they were produced within. So thank you so much. I'll encourage everyone to put any questions they have <laughs> in the Q&A box. There are already a few questions in there. I'll remind you that if you see a question you like and you wanna hear it answered, you can give it a thumbs up. Um, I'll just say that we're getting some nice notes in the chat that echo some very loud applause and some big thanks to you. So thank you. Um, but we we have so much great time for questions. So let's take advantage of it. Um, I'll start by asking a question from Alice Rose. Um, she asks whether there are signatures or marks or specific stitches that identify the makers. Mm, that's a great question. I don't know if there are stitches that would identify individuals, but certainly particular combinations are preferred, you know, in, in maybe not even an individual's work as much as um, a local community, right? A neighborhood where women did things in a certain way or a family or how a mother handed down something to her daughter, granddaughter. Um, so, for example, in Anima Bonusri uh, and Bonusri Nag Chaudhuri's work, you see particularly how tightly she packs in the stitches in the background, right? Yeah. It's a way of spacing um, and creating a certain thickness. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, the questions are rolling in. Gwen Carpenter asks, can you describe the needles or tools that the artisans use and where they are made or acquired? Mm. Um, there's lots of questions about needles that we don't really know, you know, for the 19th century material. Um, but today, I think it's mostly just regular old, you know, needles from the store. Mm -hmm. Needles and cotton thread that are the tools and scissors. That's about it, really. Very simple <laughs> materials in a way. Very accessible. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Bonnie Zetek that asks, would the kanta ever be displayed as a wall hanging in a home, for example? 
These days, yes, certainly we find them draped all over. They're created to be sometimes framed, sometimes, you know, hung. Um, there would be a loop or a hoop um, mm -hmm. for hanging them. But, um, but not so much what we would call those traditional, the older kata that I've seen hung. The only time they ha they're hung up is to air them out um, mm -hmm. in a balcony, on a rooftop, or, you know, on a clothesline in the garden. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I hope you're ready for lots of questions. So we'll keep going. Um, Barbara De Bello asks, would all girls be taught this technique and sort of at what age might they start? Good question. Um, it's hard to know what all, you know, mm -hmm. um, girls might be doing, but certainly we can say it runs across Hindus and Muslim communities. Um, and what is mesmerizing to me is across class, you know, both very poor communities will invest the time to teach their girls embroidery um, and kantha making. There's a real need, right? Um, to supplement the family income in many cases, but also in you know, in upper class families too, it is taught, it may not be um, perpetuated, right? Mm -hmm. And certainly, I mean, I grew up in Kolkata. It's not like I learned how to make katha, but between, you know, needlework in a general sense and participating in um, a variety of needlework was part of my own childhood too. Right. Well, we have a sort of um, related question from Julia Miller, which is, what is the state of Kanta embroidery work today, especially with the younger population? Hmm. Um, not so popular, I think, in the urban environments, you know, as much as we find it in smaller towns, in middle class communities, in in the rural and rural, you know, areas outside of the big cities, um, there's a huge revival actually. And, and a lot of this happened with Katha making being um, championed in the independent nation of Bangladesh, right? By about the 1980s, we find the NGOs um, really pushing Katha making as a way of making poor communities more stable, more economically self-sufficient. Um, and they provided the outlets also, right? Not just in, you know, shishi boutiques in Dhaka and Kolkata and Delhi, but you will find Katha on sale in London. Um, designers, right? Major designers like Sabya Sachi in New York. Um, using you know the work of these women right so there have been big katha revival movements that have as well as sort of the more self-help um women's empowerment groups intervening to make this uh, a continuous practice certainly um continuous in the sense that katha making never died out Right, and both traditional and these more commercial ventures are happening side by side. And one of the things I found very interesting in your in your talk is when you mentioned that these commercial ventures sometimes it's it's um, very much more like a factory environment and they're pre-produced stencils and, and and all of that. Is that linked, I guess, to this kind of appearance in upscale boutiques? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's got to be related. Um, because it, that kind of uniformity, right, to produce 20 of identical pieces or close enough to identical requires um, all of those, you know, th there's a certain kind of spontaneity that gets lost when you have three women sitting around in the afternoons um, doing what they, how their hands meander through mm -hmm. time. Well, this relates to uh, two sort of, I think, related questions that came in through the Q&A, um, which ask um, if you could please comment on industrial kanta 
uh, the comment is, it seems that they can't express aesthetically or spiritual qualities. And a related question, does the meaning change when it's done for sale? So I guess, how does um, producing them for sale, for, for appearances on a more industrial scale or in boutiques, how does that change the meaning itself? Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the playfulness gets lost for sure, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the whimsy of really taking on a pack of cards that you have at home and lining those up, right? Look closely, replicate some of those the lines, the figures, um, and then think about a play you've seen maybe or read that has something quite distinctive about it, I think. Whereas, you know, a lot of these older spectacular Kanta, actually many of Stella Kramrish's Kanta designs um, get replicated over and over and over, right? We find them in Dhaka on cushion covers, on sunglass cases, on little bags. Um, so they lose some of the qualities that we associated with the design, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You might find one boat um, rather than a katha that was comprised of multiple panels centered around a lotus blossom or, you know, a series of circular patterns, right? In the traditional form. So meaning certainly changes, aesthetic changes. Um, and I, I have not done enough work to ask whether the women who are sitting on an eight hour shift right next to each other making, you know, Kanta Shari or whatever articles, how they understand their work, whether they see it as a, as that sensibility of spirituality of, you know, a real feminine virtue in the way that, um, some of these practices were associated with the notion of the woman embodying Lakshmi, the goddess called Ghore Lokhi, the goddess of the home, right? Um, and that appreciation of the tasks together that were internalized, that maintained the stability of a large household, um, whether that can carry over, you know? into a factory production where you take your break to go to the bathroom, have your cup of tea um, and get right back on it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Pamela Scheinman writes that this was a wonderfully poetic evocation of tradition. And, and then she asks um, if you could please describe maybe the origins of Kanta and comment more on symbolism. So a broad <laughs> question. Hmm. Well, it makes me smile because um, when I first popped in to see the show this time, something hit me that it, that I hadn't quite paid attention to, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago now almost, when I was started working on these textiles. Um, and that is that there are lines, techniques, and forms, motifs that are quite continuous actually with an older body of textiles called colcha that were produced in two regions, um, part of the Portuguese trade, right? Of the Renaissance period. We find embroideries from Bengal in the East and part of India and Gujarat on the Western side that were, you know, part of this large maritime trade that um, was the reason for imperialism, right? We find them in Medici collections in the Habsburgs. Um, there's one particular um, textile in the collection of what is now hard we call in England, right? One of the earliest ones, um, Elizabeth the First's sister, half sister. Um, and there's one, uh, certainly one smaller piece when you go into the galleries, you'll see a horizontal piece composed of uh, three little squares, right? They make you think of book covers sometimes, but in this case, the motifs are shared with um, the hard we call Kanta actually, or whether you can call that a Kanta, I don't know. Um, they're usually identified as kolcha or 
coverlet from the Portuguese tradition. But it suggests that there's enough continuities, right? For things produced and saved, preserved outside of India um, that indicate that kantha making has got to have been much older. Or needlework was much, much older. Um, certainly some differences between, you know, fancy large silk coverlets for very elite clientele. Um, certainly some of them were showing you motifs that were of importance to that European clientele. And we have examples. There's actually one in the galleries in Philadelphia that's on display right now. Um, Isabella Stewart Gardner has one on display, an indigo kantha with off-white embroidery. And Boston has a couple that are on display. Um, so there is that strand that makes me think the longer um, histories of embroidery in the region. We don't have a lot of details of accounts that connect the two. So the gaps um, really have to be tied together by close looking, right? Okay. Materials, techniques that are shared between them. Thank you. And I see that we're sort of, we're getting close to time. Um, so maybe I, I'd love to share just a couple of comments that have come through. Susan Wadley um, wanted to say that this reminds um, her of quilting practices by women everywhere and the care that she puts into her quilts even today. Um, it also reminds her of the meditative work of Matila, Matila mm -hmm. art, um, which involves hundreds of lines and details. Um, and so thank you, Susan, for that. And, and Andrew Smith wrote in the chat, I really like the idea of kantha making as creating sort of a psychological space, a mental room of one's own, as it were. That's wonderful. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank, thank you uh, so much. Um, I, I feel like we've had such a, a beautiful um, conversation today. Um, yes, thank you. What a pleasure. Um, and um, yes, so a reminder to everyone, uh, a century of Kanta, it's on view until January 1st, 2024. Um, and I'll just put another link in the chat um, in case you wanted to plan your visit to revisit it or see it for the first time. Um, thank you to the Graduate Guides for sponsoring this program today. Thank you for all all of you for joining us. Um, it's really a pleasure to come together like this um, and hear from you all in the chat. Um, we hope to see you again, whether at um, future programs or in our galleries. And a few people have asked, um, we are recording this program. We're going to send out a link to the recording um, in a follow-up email so you can look back at anything we talked about. Well, with that, uh, we'll say goodbye. Thank you.